the very first case that they investigated was the Tic Tac. Uh, the person, we can now say, the person who got that assignment was a guy named Jay Stratton. Uh, the key to that hearing was a guy named Dave Fravor. Now, we've known Dave Fravor for a long time. We knew him before we could talk about him. He oozes credibility. Surveillance of journalists and, uh, you know, phones being listened to and things of that sort, which sounds like something out of a movie, but is real. Uh, it's, it's happened to me before, and I think it's probably happening to a ver variety of journalists and investigators right now. And when that comes out, and it should come out, somebody should go to jail for it. I heard one estimate of 40 whistleblowers or thereabouts in the wings ready to go. What kind of state of readiness do you believe tonight those people are in? Armed to the teeth. Wow. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever gonna get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. This is Weaponized. I'm George Knapp, joined by Jeremy Corbell. Jeremy, are you having stylists come to your house to deal with that beard? Is that what's happening? Look, man, the beard is this special thing. In the morning, wake up, don't jump in the shower, just slap your face a bunch and pull your hair down. That's that's what yeah. I do. Yeah, well, that looks good. See, if you had this just barely uh, stubble gray thing that I've got dealing with, you wouldn't have to worry about having a stylist come to the house and deal with it. Don't you have a saying from all your years of journalism, people would echo it in the halls of your network, which was fear the beards. Yeah, that's true. There's reasons for that. I thought maybe today we might talk, uh, take a little stroll down memory lane to an extent um, by talking about a really special guy. I, I, you know, the world is still sort of trying to absorb the meaning, the impact of that congressional hearing. Uh, held in Washington, D.C. just uh, days ago. And the three witnesses who appeared have generated reams of media coverage around the world. Uh, Dave Grush, I think, is getting the bulk of that coverage because of the sensational nature of things that he disclosed. But for me, uh, the key to that hearing was a guy named Dave Fravor. Now, we've known Dave Fravor for a long time. We knew him before we could talk about him. And uh, I, I say that, to me, the, the most important guy is him because he oozes credibility. You know, I, I know that for a lot of people, they think the story of the Tic Tac, the Nimitz incident is old news, but it, it's important to establish a baseline that this phenomena is real. And Dave, I think, was the most credible guy of that three, and they're all three credible. Uh, the story that he tells about his encounter with an advanced technology from somewhere else uh, is maybe the most important UFO case of all time. I think he is the most important witness in the most important UFO case of all time, because without Dave and his testimony, without the video of what he saw, it was recorded by Commander Underwood, um, I don't think that this story would have nearly the legs that it does. New York Times could still have broken a piece in December 2017, but Fravor was central to uh, the, the credibility of that piece, he is central to the credibility of the the larger narrative of military uh, encounters with unknown objects, UAP. And I thought that his appearance before Congress was essential to the committee members being convinced that this is really something worth investigating. Absolutely. So just to be clear, too, like so Commander David Fravor uh, is a is a now a longtime friend and a friend of ours. And, and the thing is, is that we're we just decided probably what was it 30 minutes ago that this is going to be the topic that we thought our audience needs to best remember and hear about normally we would have commander fravor on here to speak for himself directly and I, i'm sure we will at some point again he's a friend i mean he called me a pest on 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 national news in front of everybody you know what i mean like so we you know you know, he gets mad at me, but I pull him back in like the mafia to talk about UFOs. But, you know, he just did something big, I'm not going to bother him. But what we do have, George, is we got a, a couple pieces of, of information that I think our audience is going to really appreciate. And the world in general should hear it because, yes, Commander Fravor is 
beyond uh, he, he's impenetrable. He is just a guy that engaged UFO from the United States military, you know, head of the black aces. All of that bio is going to be in what you hear today. But check this out. Because of a tip you gave me and because um, I go a little crazy on things, I was able to get to Commander Fravor to get him to talk. And we kept his secret, George. We did that. He openly admitted that for years, kept his secret. And but what he did was gave the first audio interview where, where they'll hear our audience will hear some of that recording. I mean, first time he ever went public in full soup to nuts about what he experienced. That's an audio form. We're going to share some of that, but also video. The first time he ever went ever on camera about this was with you and me. And we did it together where you were interviewing him on stage. We were kind of like taking questions and going from there. So I'm really excited to kind of reshare this with the public because he is a badass motherfucker. Uh, fans of the Tom Cruise Top Gun movies, they know uh, the reputation of naval aviators. Those guys have flew those F-15s, the best aviators in the world. Dave yeah. Fravor was the commander of the Black Aces Squadron. So he is the best aviator in the group of the best aviators in the service that has the best aviators. He was he's Tom Cruise times 10. He's the real deal. Uh, you know, you hear we've talked to other members uh, of that squad, uh, people who were uh, colleagues of Dave back at the time and have known him since. And they speak in reverent tones about him because he's he is so credible. He knows that airplane inside and out. He knows the technology. He knows the difference between, say, some unknown object that he sees flying in the skies across uh, off of Southern California and, say, a seagull or a commercial jet or a flare. He certainly knows all that. And, you know, he has mad respect from the people who knew him and flew with him. He has mad respect from the congressional members and staff who heard from him and has our mad respect as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, besides be having a great sense of humor and always giving me shit. Um, he's one of the most experienced fighter pilots in all of American history. That is beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, you know, kind of big shout out to VFA 41, because that is the Black Aces. And, you know, on the 14th of November of that year that is now so famous in 2004 for the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group, you know, that's the story we now know as the Tic Tac UFO. And we had on our friend and Commander Fravers friend, but also somebody that took orders from Commander Fravor, and that was uh, Commander Chad Underwood. And we just had him on two weaponized episodes ago. So now we're going to fill in that void and we're going to fill in that link, you know, Commander Fravor flying a Super Hornet, the FA-18, and just, look, I want to put something into perspective before you hear from him. You got a guy that is out on a regular training mission. They, he gets a call. And they say real world tasking. They're like, oh, it's go time. Now, something, two things you don't know about Commander Fravor, and I can tell you one of them. One is that you don't know that I can tell you is he was protecting America right after the 9 11 attacks over Los Angeles. And he told me that. And that's, I think that's public. We're cool. So, this is a guy that our country trusts to protect us right after. 9-11 in the airspace over Los Angeles. Something you don't know that I can't tell you is what his current job is. Maybe it's because I don't know. But what I do know is this. I do know that whatever he's doing now al allowed him to say three things accurately. When he told Congress that we did not have that technology in 2004, we do not have that technology that I engaged today. And we are not even looking to make anything near that technology within the next 10 years of our development for national defense from an aerospace aeronautics engineering perspective. All I can say is I'm pretty damn sure that he would be in a position to know that information. So with that said, that's Commander David Fravor, a friend of ours, a patriot, a badass fighter pilot who trusted us with a secret that we kept. And now I'm so excited people get to hear from him. All right. Well, this is the first interview he ever did, a recorded audio interview, set up the circumstances that led to it. And then let's hear it. Before I cancel the uh, training exercise, uh, we have real world tasking. 
the people that say things like you saw a bird, you, you have a mistaken identity that was a conventional military drone, or it was just radar scatter. What do you say to people or what would you say to people that have that opinion? Well, everyone's going to have their opinion, but then again, I'd, I'd argue with anyone to come and discredit you know, what we saw or me or what was going on. And the fact that there's a lot of internet experts, I call them, you know, and it is what it is. And that's fine. Everyone has that. I don't have time to answer or rebut everyone. But after 18 years of flying, I would argue the fact that if all you got to do is type on the computer and try and refute someone, then I'm not going to sit and argue with you. I'm not going to take the time. But I will tell you, there, there's some extremely brilliant, brilliant people in the world that are extremely interested in this incident and other incidents to try and do something about it instead of trying to debunk poke holes and say it isn't this, it isn't that, it's a spot on the array. I mean, everyone's an expert, you know, but because you've seen a ship or you've seen an airplane or you watch Men in Black does not make you a UFO expert. I mean, I honestly saw one and I don't consider myself an expert. And I think really, if anyone's going to be one, I think it'd be the four of us that actually chased it. The act of jamming occurred on the flight where they picked up the video, the FLIR video. That's when he reported. That's correct. He picked up a return. He went attempted a lock. It immediately jammed the radar. So what's the importance of that statement? What's the importance of the idea of active jamming compared to passive jamming? What does that mean for people to understand? Well, the one is active is mean they actively try to jam the radar. Which, which you're actually not supposed to do that unless you know you're in a war or we're in a training scenario against each other. Okay, but I just like to just define the point. So what you're saying is that that is a, a kind of hostile action when you're talking about active jamming. Yeah, active jamming of a radar is a hostile action. And the tic tac actively jammed yeah. the radar. That's correct. That's uh, correct. What do you hope will happen from you speaking publicly about your experience? Um, I hope people take these serious. I hope people stop. You know, we, I mean, we knew we were going to get ridiculed and it was kind of, it was all in fun. You know, and there was nothing bad about it, but to get people to understand that they're, you know, we can learn from these things instead of thinking that everyone that sees one is crazy. It's going to be difficult to discredit the, the four of us that saw it just based on our position and what we were doing. It, you know, now you, it is public. So you kind of gave me a tip and you're like, you know, do your worst. And I'm like, cool. So I was able to earn the trust of Commander Fravor over time, you know, going through people he knew, was able to find him. And I, I knew if I could get him to talk with me and be open with me about it, it would be an incredible interview. However, I knew I could never report on it because he always would always tell me that. He goes, do not say anything. You know, I'm like, okay, cool, no problem. But tell me, tell me, tell me. So he did. Now, earning his trust as, he probably just saw me as a UFO reporter. It's like this weird, maybe I am. Maybe I'm just a UFO reporter, but he, that's how he saw me. Cause some crazy UFO guy calls him, but he quickly learned, you know, that that's, um, that I'm coming at this cause I want to know. Um, of course with you, you've got so many other things you've done. So you've got a little bit of shielding there. So you're not misbranded all the time. Right. But earning his trust was not easy, but I did it. And then that was years of conversations. And I told him over and over and over again, look, man, I'm no one's ever going to learn your secret from me, but the world is going to learn it. It's going to be huge. And once they learn it, there's no going back. You're not going to be able to just walk away, tell your story, mic drop, walk away. That ain't happening. Just so you know. And he was like, to this day, he doesn't get it. He does at times, but he, he doesn't get that, like, this is never going away. So this interview it, that you get to hear parts of is, is the very first time from soup to nuts, as they say, he went through the entire experience. And I'm so excited to be able to share this again with people. Commander Fraver and I... I know, I know. Commander Fravor <clears throat> and I have been uh, talking for quite some time, you know, obviously before your story broke the internet over and over and over again. Well, I was privileged to be able to hear directly from Commander Fravor about his experience, and, and that was really uh, an important moment. You know, I got some good intel on the events, and it was very impactful for me to hear his story at what I'm so excited about today, the first and only, he says, time, he's doing anything like this, 
is today. So I'm glad that you're here. Just everybody referred to you as this credible individual who's a straight shooter and you're gonna have no chance in hell of talking with him. You gotta talk pilot. And they're trying to coach me how to call you, like Paco, right? <laughs> trying to coach me how to call you. Uh, you know, at that time, you didn't, re I, I don't think you realized how important to people, like people here around the world, your experience was. You, you kind of pushed me off and I was like, dude, this is coming out, it's coming out big sometime. It might not be this year, but it'll be next. And that happened. It happened to you. Your face was plastered all around the media. George has done numerous news reports on your story. So I just want to know, as a human being, as somebody that everybody finds extremely credible, uh, what is that like to go from anonymous individual, pretty much, to being plastered all over the global media? What does that feel like to someone like you? <laughs> so. Funny. So I got to fill in some gaps. Um, so my friend Paco has a blog. It's called Fighter Sweep. I don't know if anyone out there read Fighter Sweep. There's a, he's the first one that wrote about this. That's how Jeremy found it. He bugged me and bugged me and bugged me. So one of the guys I used to fly with in A6s, we're all friends because Paco was A6 guy with me. So he, he, I was talking to this guy, Matt. Matt goes back, tells Paco. Paco calls me. And he's obsessed with it. He's like, really, I got to know about this. So I call him back one day. I said, hey, uh, what you need? And he goes, hang on, I'm putting you on speakerphone. I said, you're what? He says, I'm putting you on speakerphone. I said, why? He says, well, I'm having a dinner party. You got to tell the story. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I'm laughing. I tell a story. Then he starts bugging me. Hey, he wants to write about it. He wants to write about it. He wants to write about it. I'm like, no, 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 no. And like, like my kids, you pester long enough. I'll eventually give in just to shut you up. <laughs> so I let him do it. And then next thing you know, he calls me and he says, Hey, there's a guy who wants to talk to you. And, and I'm, I'm actually, kind of quiet, you know, in my real life. I like to have my privacy. So he says, hey, will you talk to this guy? So I said, yeah, and that was Jeremy. And Jeremy and I have been talking for, well, God, about, no, oh, longer than that. It's about, yeah, it's about seven or eight years we've been talking. So so a significant amount of time that him and I have been going back and forth. And he kept saying, oh, this is going to be big. Hey, I want to do a story. I kept, no, no, just like Bob. I'm like, no, 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 no. So then what happens is uh, there was four of us, and we're going to get into it, but there was four of us that actually visually saw this thing for over five minutes, okay? So it's not, we'll, we'll talk about all the videos, and I'll give you guys all the specifics. So you'll be first person hearsay, so you can go, I heard it from him, all right? So then you'll be credible, and there's actually two tapes. There's a radar tape and then the targeting flare tape. The radar tape you guys have never seen, um, and no one probably will ever see it because we don't know where it's all at, and then uh, the stuff that was on taken off of a classified drive and put on YouTube and some other things. So um, there was something below the surface that was causing the waves to break on top. When we went back, we could not find it at all. And this thing, a rendezvous, uh, a, a docking, uh, you're, you're speculating, obviously, but I mean, oh, very much. there's a relationship between the Tic Tac and what was under the water. I think so. Um, as I told Good Morning America, they asked me and they said, I said, well, maybe it was communicating with the whales like Star Trek. <laughs> and they actually put that on their broadcast. Oh. Um, so, so, so I, I don't know what was down there. I don't know if it was actually communicating, but if you want to speculate that it's, that's how we find it. We would have never seen, cause it's not that, you know, you think, God, it's 40 feet long and it's a white Tic Tac. You'd be amazed at things that you don't see because our eyes are cued to motion. So if it was just sitting still, there's probably a really good chance we'd have never seen it. But as it was doing this, that motion tracks. You know, you ever watch, you guys have rabbits get coyotes around here? You, when the, the first thing the rabbit does when the coyote shows up is sits there and doesn't move because the coyotes actually track the, the motion. If the rabbit runs, the coyote's locked in. They wait till the coyote gets closer and then they run. Um, but sometimes they'll sit there and, and the animals will move on. So it's kind of that as we're watching it, we're trying to get cued in and when it's moving, you go, and literally, so you see the disturbance and you see this bright white thing moving around. You go, what the is that? One of the guys are talking and it starts to rotate. You know, it looks like a kind of a saucer with the thing sticking on top and bottom does this. Okay, so I talked to one of the crews that was out there doing that, that was out there when the video was shot. Um, if you understand what you're looking at, it's because people are like, ah, oh, it could be an airplane. No, it couldn't be. If you actually, and there's, there's debunkers that say, oh, it's this, it's not. Um, usually when an airplane rolls at this point, there's this thing that keeps us flying, their wings, and wings create lift. When you go like this, there is no lift. 
it will, if, you don't, if you don't pull, it does this, right? So really, in theory, like a 90 degree angle of bank, who's seen the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds when they do They're really not totally at 90. They, have to, they use a little rudder and they can do some things to keep the airplane as it flies by, their knife heads pass. Um, but truly at zero degrees or 90 degrees angle of bank, there is zero lift being created and the airplane will start to descend. The airplane, it just sits there. Um, so if it, if it does, it has to put G on and then you're gonna see an aspect change like this. So if it's this way, you're gonna see this or you're gonna see this. Um, in that video, you don't see any change. It just sits there. And it rolls around like this. It doesn't move. You get, you get no aspect change at all. It's not an airplane that we, no. get, we know. No, actually, they, they almost hit one. Um, there's a couple things I see. This is all off Virginia, by the way. It's the Vacapes. So there's whiskey areas out there, too. That's where NAS Oceana goes out and trains. So they actually, there's a couple things. They've tracked them at, at just sitting there. They've tracked them at high rates of speed. They've been tracked lots. The radars they're using now are even better than the ones that I had uh, in the Super Hornet. It's pretty amazing. So more advanced technology, you know, cooler stuff, more capable. They're seeing it. At first they thought they were, when they first saw it, they thought, all oh, these are just ghost hits. And I'm like, no, nah, that radar really doesn't provide ghost hits, which are false targets. It's pretty good. And then someone actually threw their targeting pot out there, and there was something there, because you can't hide from the targeting pot if you've got any type of heat signature. And that's what really started this. But they, they've been seen by many people as far as on the radar. And there's been a couple that have seen visual, because one guy almost hit one. It was just sitting there. This is recent. This is real recent. This is within the last five years. Did they describe these things as conventional aircraft, or wh how did they describe these things they almost hit, Dave? They describe it as, well, the one that almost got hit was like a, a clear beach ball sphere with a cube inside, so the little apex of each corner hit the cube. So I don't know if it's like a, you know, is it a beach ball or is it like a force field? I don't know. Um, there's something around it. Um, they never... They never, this is, this is kind of what's prompting, I think they're getting heat from other avenues of the government because of what happened with our incident that, you know, hindsight being 2020, which is how I live my life. Um, yeah, uh, probably should have done something about it. Uh, you know, maybe put a little effort into this. If not to go figure out what can come in and penetrate a battle group like that, but God, just what if we, what if we can harness that technology? What if you can reverse engineer that technology? Very much what Bob was talking about to go, can we do this? Because a technology that would do that would change, change everything we do. You can hide stuff for a period of time, but eventually it, the rumors are gonna come out that you're gonna start to, to see something like this. And after 15 years, you know, we're, we're still pumping diesel fuel and jet engines and sucking air in and blowing it out the back to make us go. And I'd go, man, if you have this, Self-driving cars, Tesla. So after the New York Times story breaks in December of 2017, Dave Fravor is much in demand by media folks who want to follow up on these incredible stories. Um, and of course, you know, as we know, he did not welcome that embrace of the media. He wasn't out to be a UFO celebrity. He did sit down for a couple of short little bursts of interviews, I think, on maybe CNN, uh, maybe on Fox. But he, he didn't like it. Um, and as, as you've pointed out, we're, we're the arm twisters when it comes to Dave. We've pestered him about doing some things. And we told him about a really fun event. Here's a chance to do something really fun. McMinnville, Oregon, that little town, which has its own long history associated with the UFO topic, puts on the, the McMinniman's uh, um, company, puts on maybe the most fun UFO event of the year, uh, the most fun community-wide that we've ever done. Uh, and I had I had spoken there before and told you guys about it. And then uh, they had approached us about, hey, maybe Dave Fraber would do this. We said, well, let, let us try to talk him into it. And we did. And we'd only talked him into making his first long-form interview on stage, his first and maybe only public appearance to talk about the uh, Tic Tac incident. We also talked another friend of ours, Bob Lazar, into coming to that same event. Dave Politis was there too. And uh, that that gathering uh, was momentous. So we, we remember the night before we went on stage with Dave, we got in, together in a hotel room with Lazar and they got into this big, long, detailed discussion and they really hit it off. That's a side story for another time. But the next day we introduced Dave on stage, do a live interview with him, the only public event I think he's ever done. And went into all the details 
about the Tic Tac and the subsequent events that happened as a result of that. It was an amazing, as an amazing experience. It was an amazing. There's so many things that came up when you just said that. First of all, yes, there was this very cool private conversation where we're all in this room with Commander Fravor and Lazar, and they'd never met each other. And instantaneously, there were some things that they both recognized within one another that allowed them to have this really unique bond. Like, like we shouldn't have even been in the room. They were really, there was something going on there that was really important that I hope, um, you know, they'll talk about, but it was just really cool to see that acknowledgement. Now it was a heroic lift because you and I are the pests of these people. We are the pests. We get them to show up. We get them to throw down. Look, man, I am totally cool with being the past. We are trying to get information out and public. So that event is so fun. I've got these cool clips that now we're talking about it. We've got to play some of these for people. There is a UFO parade. I mean, I have never, I had never been in a UFO parade, George. And like, there we are going through this parade and there's like photos and videos of just, it is so much fun. They only invite you once is the problem with, with McMenamins and the McMinnville UFO Fest. Oh, but all of a sudden there's George Knapp twice. There's George Knapp three times. It was crazy. So uh, obviously you're somebody that they had a bunch. I hope they invite us again. I'm going to do everything in my power to get invited again because it is so much fun. But yeah, we brought Bob Lazar and Commander David Fravor. Now, at that time, George, people didn't believe you about things. They didn't believe you that UFOs were being sighted on a daily basis. Remember, the public was not caught up at all at that time. And there's Commander Fravor on stage. I mean, this is like a, a coup. There he is telling you stuff like, we might have met with people. I can tell you this. He said, we met with people behind the scenes, very serious people taking this very seriously, which now we all obviously know. But at that time, we couldn't say exactly what and who and where this was going. So looking back at it, dude, I get teary eyed. Like, that is crazy to me. So look, man, um, what I'm going to do is this. Uh, I, I haven't told Commander Fravor that we're going to be talking about him because we just decided that 30 minutes ago. So I'm going <laughs> to text. I'm going to actually I'll send a little video to him right now. Just showing him that we're recording this episode and, and ask if his ears are burning. I'm not, not looking for a response, but I feel like a duty to do this. So um, I'm going to do a little video. And as you know, George, um, I don't like typing. So I send videos to everybody. And you told me that's going to bite my bite me in the ass one day. Yeah. OK, <laughs> so. Hey, Commander Fravor, are your ears burning? Uh, I just want to show you something real quick. So 30 minutes ago, George and I were like, what does the world need to hear about? What they need to hear about is kind of our friendship a little bit. So I'm talking with George right now. We're recording a weaponized right now. Don't call me. I'm not looking to talk with you unless you want to call me. But I just want to show you. Here's George Knapp right there. Hey, Dave, aren't you always glad when you get a message from Jeremy? You know it's going to be fun. <laughs> Anyway, man, we're recording Weaponized, and we're just talking about you. thought your ears would be burning, sending you love. All right, talk to you soon, brother. Let me send that to him. He'll probably call me all angry. <laughs> okay, whatever. I'll leave my phone on, so if it dings. Um, yeah, so anyway, so to explain that, so so it's like I don't like, you know, surprising people or anything like that. And, and um, Commander Fraber is a good friend, good sense of humor, likes to push on me and flex on me a little bit. So I'll just say, hey, Fraber, you had the coolest boots at the hearings, just so you know. He had, he had really cool boots on. Um, he's like, yeah, I'm talking and then I'm leaving. I'm talking and then leaving. I've got a job to do, Jeremy. It's called a job. Do you know what a job is? He was like saying shit like that to me. So he went right from the hearings, went to a, like a satellite office or something and did a job. So we didn't get to like have a beer after, but we, we've talked you, you, me and him kind of through text and everything. And I think he's really happy that he threw down. Um, I, I know that was not his impetus. I know that he was just like, you know, look, man, why is this important? It's important because people need to hear from you directly in this setting. Again, you have never been under oath in front of Congress on national television and told what it is that you know and experienced. Why don't you just do it just one more time for us, Dave? Just one more time. 
Yeah, he was. Uh, you you really did have to twist his arm to do this because you know, I know I think he would like to move on from the UFO subject matter and put it behind him. But he knows that that's not ever going to happen, that it's always going to be something in the public eye. And and the, the public does have a legitimate reason to be interested. I remember before the hearing, we were talking with him in the uh, in the sort of the green room prior to walking out into the hearing room. And he was saying, look, uh, I'm going to tell the story, but they're not going to get out of me what they hope to get. I don't know what his anticipation was about what what he expected them to want from him. Um, you know, he's careful in the story that he tells. He doesn't leap to conclusions like, yes, these aliens are from Krypton in the Ursa Major uh, constellation or something like that. He doesn't expound. He doesn't guess. He just tells the facts of the story. And they're enough. That That encounter is enough. And if it was the only encounter in history, it's a pretty good one. Uh, and let me clarify for you, because I know exactly what he was talking about. And I remember that exact moment when he kind of said that to us. Um, I know Dave, and, and what he was talking about is national security. He is very serious about that. He's like, the, the public does not need to know everything. So he's he thought, maybe he thought like they were going to ask him questions he couldn't answer. However, unambiguously, let's make sure people understand this, unambiguously, he knows that what he saw, America and no known foreign nation that we're aware of made, that is unambiguous in his mind. And he said that himself and he'll say it again, unambiguous. Now, where it's from, what it is, what the intent, all that stuff, he's theorized before he's talked about that. But his line is America. His line is national security. He will not cross that. That is real. And that is what he was talking about. And again, I don't know what he was expecting, kind of like what you just said. But that was the point when we're in that kind of green room, we're back there kind of shielding these witnesses from bad actors and from the insanity of it all, right, is just, um, you know, yeah, he he's willing to tell. But I did notice my friend Dave, I did notice. So he's a man that is very direct and he'll answer specifically, but you got to listen to what he's saying. Now, you notice sometimes he just hit the, the little red button we saw. And so, so he knows his voice is heard through the mic and he'll be like, no, and hit it back. So he was trying to be as forthright and have the right impression of exactly what he is trying to say. He wasn't hiding nothing. He was trying to let people know. And so I really, man, if you watch his testimony again, if you watch that, you're going to learn a lot if you really think about it. You know, I've said before um, that I think he is the most important witness in the most important case of all time. And there's another reason why I, I consider that to be the most important is because of what it represents. Uh, you know, in in Five years after the Tic Tac incident, there had not been an official investigation. The Navy, whatever information they gathered, they threw it in a drawer and moved away, and they weren't going to deal with it anymore. They, they didn't want to deal with it. But a special program was created called OSAP with the help of Harry Reid, two other U.S. senators. They put together $22 million black budget money to kick this thing off. The contract was awarded to Robert Bigelow and a subsidiary of his company, Bigelow Aerospace, something called Bass. And the very first case that they investigated was the Tic Tac. Uh, the person, we can now say, the person who got that assignment was a guy named Jay Stratton. Now, there was a report that he prepared. He went to meet with Dave and, and other witnesses. Uh, he put together this report. It's 13, 14 pages. The world had never seen it, but that was the first case investigated under OSAP. It became sort of the launching point for that program, the largest government-funded UFO investigation in history that we know of. Uh, and nearly all of what was produced by OSAP has never been made public. It was one of the points that you and I made to the committee in our papers uh, that we presented to that committee on the record. Um, but there was something released. I released it in 2018 with permission. Now, there's no insignia on this document. There's nobody that signs it, but we now know who produced it and what it was produced for. And it went into considerable detail uh, about that Tic Tac Nimitz incident and Dave Fravor's role in it. And it's, it's a crucial piece of evidence. It's a crucial piece of information. Yeah. And also just an interesting moment to clarify here is that 
So you and I also, we got to be friends with Commander Chad Underwood and Chad Underwood trusted us and allowed me to do a little interview with him, his ever first filmed interview. And that was out on my YouTube before he came on Weaponized. And in that interview, he said something like, oh yeah, I would, I have talked to you, Jeremy, more than any agency, any government entity, you know more, I have talked to you more than anybody. How many times do you and I hear that? Like the, the depth with which we talk with people over years is so much more. So he says, yeah, I was never officially interviewed for that. And then people threw that back in his face saying, oh, he's lying because in this report that George put out, there's an interview. Well, let me tell you something the world doesn't know. He didn't know that he was being officially interviewed because it was for like an agency, the the DIA, as you've kind of mentioned, into Bass, right? OSAP, Bass, DIA. It was conducted in a Chili's. So he wouldn't consider that a formalized interview, you know? So it's like it, you demystify stuff really quick when you realize that what, what they're doing is they're meeting, they're getting information. It, this is not something they're running around screaming, Osep, that we're doing these investigations. This was a secret program, right, George? Yeah. And so the 13 or 14 page uh, document that Jay Stratton created became sort of the uh, centerpiece of a much broader uh, investigation by Bass for OSAP. That ended up being a huge report. I wanted to provide that to the committee. I'm not authorized to do it. It's not mine to give. And I know I've caught a lot of crap from that. I'm now part of the cover-up because I won't violate a promise that I made or, you know, and release stuff that is not mine to release. I'd like that information to be made public. I'd like all of the OSAP reports and documents to be made public, but it's not mine to release. It's I don't have it. And I don't want to get myself in trouble. I don't want to get other people in trouble. This should be done through channels. Congress should go after that stuff and get it and release it legally. But it's it's not for me to do it. But that that report is pretty substantial. And um and it built on the testimony that Dave Fravor and Underwood gave to Jay Stratton for that very first report. Let's talk about these two uh, names that uh, people need to understand more about. Uh, uh, before, So that would be Jay Stratton and Lekatsky. But before we talk about them, let's just be really clear. Why did you not release the report? Why? I'm not authorized to do it. It's not mine. And, and uh, more to the point is, you know, I've been allowed to see some things. Uh, under the condition that I not make it public. I'm allowed to see it um, so that I know I can know what is in there and it helps me navigate UFO world. I can figure out who's full of baloney and who isn't. Uh, it is useful for me to know that stuff, but I cannot release something in particular because of what it would do to other people who have helped me. I don't want somebody to, to get into trouble, lose their pension, go to jail because they shared some information with me um, under condition that I not make it public or, or report on it. Um, I don't want that that on my conscience. And I would not violate that promise because once you do it, once you violate that promise and you ignore the conditions under which you receive information, you will never get information like that again. And, and so, they would be right to cut me off. And so let's be really clear and honest with our audience, the American public and everything, which is that it's so hard for people to understand until we can tell the full story, but we don't have a source. We don't have one source. The sources that come to us are not the people we know that are our friends. If it was the people we know that are our friends, we wouldn't receive anything from them. But the people we know and are our friends, they would never cross that line. So the originator of the leaks to us are not the people that we know and associate with. And that's so hard for people to understand that it's like we have to receive things multiple times, multiple times to like really be in possession of them and feel strongly about it. So people's minds will go crazy about like who leaks information to us. And the coolest thing Really, for me, this is just between you and me, George. Like, but I mean, I guess the world can't hear this. The coolest thing for me is that we have so many varied sources 
that come to us independently, then you and I can fact check one another with our own separate, um, I don't know, circles that we're confident with something enough to bring into the public realm. So I think that's just really important for people to hear that you protected sources, but it's not who people might think. And that's what's so weird to me. And I wish we could explain it and we just can't. But also I wish to, like the American public, George, I wish I could really thoroughly and read what, it, you know, that information. I, I want to know it too. So I'm like with everybody else, which is that if I have the luxury of being able to do that, man, my brain would explode. But I know that you've seen some things and you can tell us, and I, I trust, uh, you know, that um, you, you'll you tell us as much as you can about that kind of stuff, right? And yeah, and I will push for it to be released legally okay. through the okay. right channels and it should be released. There's no reason it shouldn't. It should be made public, and hopefully, we've uh, we've wet the appetite of uh, members of Congress that they can go ahead and go after it because it's going to take their kind of authority to go and get it. Okay, and it's no secret that, and people should really hear this: is that on the second episode of Weaponized, um, you were able, after many years, to have a guy trust you named Jay Stratton, who you always tell people it's not he was just part of a UFO program. He was in. He was the only guy that was in there when it took all these different forms. So you have these heroes that pop up, like Lou Elizondo. Man, really took something, made something out of it. So Jay Stratton is a hero behind these scenes for what he tried to do for the American public. And I would also say so is in a different way, James Lakatsky, the, he's a co-author on a number of your books. I know that. But my experience, just so I, there's an independent experience out there in the world, is that this is a guy who's a patriot and has done some incredible, it sounds like, work you know, for the American public, for the DIA. And one day I hope the totality of his story can also be told. I hope it's unweaponized. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, just to remind our listeners, uh, Dr. Lekatsky is a, a longtime intelligence analyst who was working at DIA. He's a specialist in rockets. And he was working with Jay Stratton at DIA. Jay had come over from the Navy and was working with him at DIA when they both read Hunt for the Skinwalker. And they became interested in this crazy place in northeastern Utah and uh, Lukatsky eventually made a trip out there, met with Bob Bigelow, came back, met with Harry Reid, and proposed the creation of what became OSAP. And uh, Jay Stratton was right there working with him on, on that program once it was authorized. But they knew each other before OSAP. They worked together during OSAP. Then Jay became a confident, confidant to Lou Elizondo in ATIP, which picked up the pieces after OSAP was gone. And then Jay became the head of the UAP task force before it was called that, before it was formally existed. When it was ratified and created by Congress, he was in charge of it, put together the, some, some incredible presentations, gathered information, met with the Joint Chiefs, with Congress, with defense contractors, tried to bring them up to speed about the importance uh, of investigating UAP and how to recognize them and what to do with the information. Jay is the only person to be an OSAP, ATIP, UAPTF, and a lot of the work that he did set the stage for what we now know as Arrow. I wish Jay were still involved. I wish he were in charge of Arrow, but he's not. He's now in 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 um, working for a private company. But uh, anyway, that sets the stage with Lukaski and Stratton. Now back to Dave. Okay, back to Dave. But can we play one more tiny clip of Jay Stratton's your interview with Jay Stratton that we were at? like probably not? You got to ask him. We probably don't have time before this comes out. But it would be so neat to give the world the rest of that interview in the appropriate form because man, he's somebody that we got to hear more from. Is Jay Stratton? So George, before this comes out, if we can play a clip, another one of Jay, we'll put it here. If not, let's talk about Fravor again. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we. Yeah, because I haven't I haven't set the stage for that. And I think he's a little nervous about it. So, yeah. OK, not fair doing. enough. You can yeah. take a clip that we already aired and stick it in here. I think that's great. I think people need to go back and look at episode. I think it was two of Weaponize or was three, three episode three of Weaponize with, with Jay Stratton. I think they should go back and look at that. But, you know, here's a little clip so that people kind of get an impression of who Jay Stratton is and how he trusted you to do an interview with him first ever. Can you describe for me at what point UFOs, they were called then, UAPs now, at what point that kind of got on your radar screen? Was it something you had at least a casual interest in 
growing up or it came a point in your professional career that it, it landed on your desk? Yeah, every time I've done anything related to UAP or UFO has been my job. Um, and, and what I mean by that, I didn't really have a, a passion growing up. I didn't have all the books. I didn't watch all the TV shows. Um, I stepped into a job I, at the Defense Intelligence Agency where uh, some things came across the desk, again, thinking technologies and other things where I needed to, to really kind of dig in and understand potentials. And those potentials, uh, you know, I kept an open mind, a skeptic mind, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, looking for uh, something that could answer this uh, and all the means that I had to, 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 to chase that. Uh, but there were definitely some times where we really couldn't close the loop. And with that, uh, we realized that, that uh, something needed to be done about it. Back to Dave Fraber. So Commander David Fraber, uh, American patriot, American hero, uh, you know, head of the Black Aces, just all around badass. I am so glad that he threw down at that hearing. And I'm so glad that 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 people were able to hear him under oath in that setting. I'm really proud of him. I'm proud of him as a friend for getting over his, you know, being bothered by it, not even wanting to, to do this anymore, but but doing it for public good. Really appreciate that. And look, he's, you know, he's um he is probably one of the most important voices. He'll hate that we're saying this, but he's probably one of the most important voices in what's going on now, this movement. So I got a question for you, George. Where in conclusion, you know, we can wrap up here, but where does this go, George? Everybody's asking me. I've been ghosting the media. Everybody's asking me, where does this go from here? What's the next step? We were just told that our government allegedly has these back engineering programs for, for, for UFOs, and there are biologicals associated with this. Oh, my Lord. My mom is seeing this on TV. Where do we go from here, George? What's the next step? Well, a couple things. First, in the House, uh, three members of that uh, subcommittee uh, who held, were involved in that hearing have petitioned the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, for permission to create a special select committee that would have subpoena power to go after some of the things we heard about from the witnesses, specifically the kinds of things that really should boil the blood of every taxpayer in this country. That is that millions, untold millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars that were approved for select special access programs, legitimate national security programs, that money was funneled into something else and that Congress was not allowed to know about it, not even the oversight function. They were not allowed to know about it. This money was pumped into something else uh, that they were not authorized to even know existed. They're mad about that. And it might take a special committee, a select committee, with subpoena powers to get to the bottom of it. The investigation in, isn't necessarily about aliens or ETs or interdimensionals or these non-human intelligence that Dave Grush spoke about. We don't even know who that is. And we don't really know if we'll ever understand it. But we need to get to the bottom of the special access programs and where that money has been funneled and the cover-up issues. That should be enough. And, and if we get to the bottom of that through that committee or something else, uh, I think we'll have a much bigger, un better understanding of the uh, non-human intelligence that's been interacting with us, apparently, uh, for centuries. On the Senate side, we've heard hints from Marco Rubio that they've got something coming. Uh, he and Kirsten Gillibrand, they got a hearing coming of their own. Now, I don't know how soon that's going to be, but where they're going to drop some bombs with some additional witnesses. That's going to generate more media interest, more investigations uh, on behalf of the public. And, you know, I think at some point the White House is not going to be able to sit on the sidelines anymore. They're going to have to get involved, assuming the public and people like us help keep the pressure on uh, that they need to dig into this. Yeah. So you're, you're getting me fired up right now. So what you're talking about, uh, I do have specific knowledge about like, yeah, man, people are pushing and you and I know that. Now, how that looks one step at a time, one step at a time. But I got to do a big shout out to to Representative Tim Burchett. He is a true UFO, UAP transparency warrior. 
Every single single thing he said was going to happen, happened. I mean, we're talking about bipartisan. Turns out, I think he and AOC are friends. They don't agree on nothing, but they are friends. And that was so cool to see. Big shout out to Representative Tim Burchett for kicking some UFO and bureaucrat ass the other day, straight up. Um, There are some things that are very concerning to me that I have learned um, on our trip to D.C. that I just you always tell me, you know, journalists have should have a healthy paranoia. Wow, man. Wow. I didn't know. We're talking about fraud. We're talking about fraud to the American public on the deepest levels possible. That is happening right now. That is true. With that said, that's why. And, And so on that note, we should have a church style committee. The church committee, for people that don't know, because I didn't know till I knew, was looking at the intelligence community's misconduct. It was a revolutionary moment where we found out about things that are not conspiracy and fantasy, but are fact, like programs called um, MKUltra, which use psychedelic drugs and manipulated citizens unknowingly drugging them. That was a power abused by the CIA. Additionally, we learned about things like Project Mockingbird, where journalists like you and me being co-opted by an intelligence agency knowingly or unknowingly. And you and I are always on guard for that. And it turns out that's a real thing and we should be on guard for it. So my mind was just kind of blown open when it was like the depth with which, so I take people through this now. I go, okay, mom, tell my mom. If you just believe UFOs are real, let's just go there. Let's pretend for one second, you believe UFOs are real. And then, okay, if you'll agree with me that we would study that shit, and we have been. Let's just leap in logic. And then we've been covering it up. I just need you to to be on me with those three things. If you just agree with me for a second, that's possible. Do you think, this is the fourth step, do you think for one second that those individuals, those factions wouldn't do things absolutely unconstitutionally illegal right now today that's that leap people have to make because i'm sorry to report like it it really makes me sad and mad that that is happening right now those pressures are real on witnesses on all that stuff one last thing I was told I have avoided the media. I have avoided going on the media as much as I can. And I have avoided reading anything straight up. Haven't opened an email other than yours, George, and like a couple family members up till now, weeks. What I did hear was that AOC threw down, that she did some rant where she is talking to a camera, eating a salad or something and talking about this topic. And I thought, oh my gosh, how great is this? She was fired up, but not, it has nothing to do with UFOs and aliens. She is fired up that if there is misappropriation of funds, which is theft, that they're going to get to the bottom of it. So if we can play a part of that, that'd be great. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard all about it. Did you see that? Let me start off this whole UAP discussion by just stating the obvious, which is that people don't trust the government. And why would you? We're spending trillions of dollars over years on military budgets that can't pass an audit and half of which go to a bunch of private companies that are price gouging the public and engaged in corrupt activity we know that that's true because we've uncovered it in the past yeah it did yeah she is fired up and i'm I'm glad to see it and she should be and other members of the congress of congress should be as well i mean uh, you know we i mentioned about the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars misappropriated, covered up. But there's other aspects to this that are equally disturbing. Disinformation and propaganda. Dave Grush spoke about ongoing efforts to mislead the public uh, on this on this topic. That's happening now. Uh, Surveillance, surveillance of potential whistleblowers, threats against potential whistleblowers, surveillance of journalists and, uh, you know, phones being listened to and things of that sort, which sounds like something out of a movie, but is real. Uh, it's it's happened to me before, and I think it's probably happening to a ver- variety of journalists and investigators right now. And when that comes out, and it should come out, somebody should go to jail for it. They should go to jail. And it will come out because good journalists 
always have proof for the things they say, whether or not they release it at this time. So with that said, let's end on a light note. Um, Man, I'm so excited kind of where we're at because this is the first time where I do not have any idea what is possible anymore. Now, anything is possible about uncovering the truth because I just want to know. I just want to know what are UFOs? What do they represent to humanity? I don't even care where where they're from. I want to know what it represents to humanity, meaning is it more than something we're just seeing now or is it something that has influenced our own development? These are the big questions, but, but I really want to know. Well, we've come a long way in the past five and a half years. As I've said before, it's now a cliche. Uh, I never thought I would live to see this much progress, but it's just a start. Uh, there is yeah. a long way to go. And believe me, um, the people who are the keepers of the secrets are not going down without a fight. And the closer we, the public, gets to the goodies, the real stuff, the saucers, the the metamaterials, the biological uh, remains, the closer we get to that, the harder they're going to fight. There's a long way to go. And a victory is not assured. So people got to keep the pedal to the metal i said let's end on a good note so you're coming right back at me with that Ah! just being realistic here just being realistic don't get overconfident you know the public shouldn't think that okay the work here is done there is a long way to go okay so so you're right and we're going to end on that note in that um we're not going to just you know say yeah everything's great it's going to be great i'm so excited can't wait to see what happens we need to protect the truth. We need to protect David Grush because how he is treated now, how David Grush is treated now is going to determine if we're ever going to be able to verify the hundred important things that he said. Like we've verified a lot, George, but the public hasn't yet. So how David Grush is treated, the public needs to protect him. And the way to protect him is to be loud, to to be bold and to talk about it, to have the conversation, because he is the kind of like the thumb in the dam right now for stuff. And it's like, in order for this information to come out in a controlled way, um, we need to protect the right to assess what he told people. And, and, and that's where we're at. And that's pretty scary, but that's where we're at. Well, as we know, Dave is uh, Dave is confident, wants to go forward. He's not backing down. I think some of the people, the other people in that circle are, are watching closely, but they're ready to come forward too. Some of them already have. When that stuff comes spilling out, it'll be a good day for the public. And uh, on that note, I guess that's sort of semi-optimistic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Semi- okay. On that note, we'll call it a day for this episode. And we got some good stuff coming up in the weeks ahead. All right. Thanks so much, George. Cadence 13 Studios, available now for free on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your shows.